Section 3 of Anecdotes of Dogs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Jackson. Anecdotes of Dogs by Edward Jesse. Introduction, Part 3. It is, I believe, a fact, and if so, it is a curious one, that the dog in a wild state only howls. But when he becomes the friend and companion of man, he has then wants and wishes, hopes and fears, joys and sorrows, to which in his wilder state he appears to have been a stranger. His vocabulary, if it may be so called, then increases, in order to express his enlarged and varying emotions. He anticipates rewards and punishments, and learns to solicit the former and deprecate the latter. He bounds exultingly forth to accompany his master in his walks, rides, and sports of the field. He acts as the faithful guardian of his property. He is his fireside companion, evidently discerns days of household mirth or grief, and deports himself accordingly. Hence his energies and his sensibilities are all expanded, and what he feels he seeks to tell in various accents and in different ways. For instance, our little dog comes and pulls his mistress's gown and makes significant whines if any one is in or about the premises whom he thinks has no right to be there. I have seen a dog pick up a stick and bring it in his mouth to his master, looking at the water first and then at his master, evidently that the stick might be thrown into it, that he might have the pleasure of swimming after it. In my younger days I was in the habit of teasing a favorite dog by twitching his nose and pretending to pull his ears. He would snap gently at me, but if by accident he gave me a rather harder bite than he had intended, he became instantly aware of it, and expressed his regret in a way not to be mistaken. Dogs who have hurt or cut themselves will submit patiently while the wound is being dressed, however much the operation may hurt them. They become instantly sensible that no punishment is intended to be inflicted, and I have seen them lick the hand of the operator, as if grateful for what he was doing. Those who are in the habit of having dogs constantly in the room with them will have perceived how alive they are to the slightest change in the countenance of their master, how gently they will touch him with their paw when he is eating in order to remind him of their own want of food, and how readily they distinguish the movements of any inmate of the house from those of a stranger. These and many other circumstances which might be mentioned show a marked distinction between a domesticated dog and one that is wild or who has lived with people who are in an uncivilized state, such as the Eskimo, etc. Both the wild and domestic dog, however, appear to be possessed of and to exercise forethought. They will bury or hide food, which they are unable to consume at once, and return for it. But the domestic dog, perhaps, gives stronger proofs of forethought, and I will give an instance of it. A large metal pot turned on one side, in which a great quantity of porridge has been boiled, was then set before a Newfoundland puppy of three or four months old. At first he contented himself by licking off portions of the oatmeal which adhered to the interior, but finding this unsatisfactory, he scraped the morsels with his forepaws into a heap and then ate the whole at once. I had a dog who, having once scalded his tongue, Always afterwards, when I gave him his milk and water at breakfast, put his paw very cautiously into the saucer to see if the liquid was too hot before he would touch it with his tongue. Dogs have frequently been known to hunt in couples, that is, to assist each other in securing their prey, thus associating together and admitting of no partnership. At Palermo, in Sicily, there is an extraordinary quantity of dogs wandering about without owners. Amongst the number, two more particularly distinguished themselves for their animosity to cats. One day they were in pursuit of a cat which, seeing no other place of refuge near, made her escape into a long earthen water pipe which was lying on the ground. These two inseparable companions, who always supported each other, pursued the cat to the pipe where they were seen to stop and apparently to consult each other as to what was being done to deceive and get possession of the poor cat. After they had stood a short time, they divided, taking post at each end of the pipe, and began to back alternately, thus giving the cat reason to suppose that they were both at one end in order to induce her to come out. This maneuver had a successful result, and the cheated cat left her hiding place. Scarcely had she ventured out when she was seized by one of the dogs, 
the other hastened to his assistance, and in a few moments deprived her of life. Footnote. Thornton's Instincts. The memory of dogs is quite extraordinary, and only equaled by that of the elephant. Mr. Swainson, in his work on the instincts of animals, gives the following proof of this. He says that a spaniel belonging to the Reverend H. N., being always told that he must not follow his master to church on Sundays, used on those days to set off long before the service and lie concealed under the hedge so near the church that at length the point was yielded to him. My little parlor dog never offers to go with me on a Sunday, although on other days he is perfectly wild to accompany me in my walks. In my younger days I had a favorite dog, which always accompanied me to church. My mother, seeing that he attracted too much of my attention, ordered the servant to shut him every Sunday morning. This was done once, but never afterwards, for he concealed himself early every Sunday morning, and I was sure to find him either under my seat at church or else at the church door. That dogs clearly distinguish the return of Sunday cannot be doubted. The almost incredible penetration and expedition with which dogs are known to return to their former homes from places to which they have been sent or carried in such a recluse way as to not retain a trace of the road will ever continue to excite the greatest admiration. A dog having been given by a gentleman at Wivenhoe to the captain of a collier, he took the dog on board his vessel and landed him at Sunderland. But soon after his arrival, there the dog was missing and in a few days arrived at the residence of his old master in Essex. A still more extraordinary circumstance is upon record of the late Colonel Hardy, who, having been sent for express to Bath, was accompanied by a favorite spaniel bitch in his chaise, which he never quitted till his arrival there. After remaining there four days, he accidentally left his spaniel behind him, and returned to his residence at Springfield, in Essex, with equal expedition, where, in three days after, his faithful and steady adherent arrived also, notwithstanding the distance between that place and Bath is one hundred forty miles, and she had to explore her way through London, to which she had never been except in her passage to Bath, and then within the confines of a close carriage. Footnote sportsman's cabinet in the small town of melbourne in derbyshire cocks and hens may be seen running about the streets one day a game cock attacked a small bantam and they fought furiously the bantam having of course the worst of it some persons were standing about looking at the fight when my informant's house dog suddenly darted out snatched up the bantam in his mouth and carried it into the house Several of the spectators followed, believing that the poor fowl would be killed and eaten by the dog, but his intentions were of a more benevolent nature. After guarding the entrance of the kennel for some time, he trotted down the yard into the street, looked about to the right and left, and seeing that the coast was clear, he went back again, and once more, returning with his protégé in his mouth, safely deposited him in the street, and then walked quietly away. How few human beings would have acted as this dog had done! Here is another curious anecdote from Mr. Davy's work. He says that the cook in the house of a friend of his, a lady on whose accuracy he could rely, and from whom he had the anecdote, missed a marrowbone. Suspicion fell on a well-behaved dog, a great favorite, and up to that time distinguished for his honesty. He was charged with a theft. He hung down his tail and, for a day or two, was altered in his manner, having become shy, sullen, and sheepish, to use these expressions for want of better. In this mood he continued, till, to the amusement of the cook, he brought back the bone and laid it at her feet. Then, with the restoration of her stolen property, he resumed his cheerful manner. How can we interpret this conduct of the dog, better than by supposing that he was aware he had done amiss, and that the evil doing preyed on him till he had made restitution? Was not this a kind of moral sense? If a dog finds a bone while he is accompanying his master in a walk, he does not stay behind to gnaw it, but runs some distance in advance, attacks the bone, waits till his master comes up, and then proceeds forward again with it. By acting in this manner, he never loses sight of his master. A dog has been known to convey food to another of his species, who was tied up and pining for want of it. A dog has frequently been seen to plunge voluntarily into a rapid stream to rescue another that was in danger of drowning. 
he has defended helpless curs from the attacks of other dogs and learns to apportion punishment according to the provocation received frequently disdaining to exercise his power and strength on the weaker adversary repeated provocation will however excite and revenge for instance a newfoundland dog was quietly eating his mess of broth and broken scraps while so employed a turkey endeavoured to share the meal with him the dog growled and displayed his teeth the intruder retired for a moment but quickly returned to the charge and was again warned off with a like result after three or four attempts of the same kind the dog became provoked gave a sudden ferocious growl bit off the delinquent's head and then quietly finished his meal without bestowing any further attention on his victim the celebrated Leibnitz related to the French Academy an account of a dog he had seen which was taught to speak, and could call in an intelligible manner for tea, coffee, chocolate, etc. The dog was of a middling size and the property of a peasant in Saxony. A little boy, the peasant's son, imagined that he perceived in the dog's voice an indistinct resemblance to certain words and was, therefore, determined to teach him to speak distinctly. For this purpose, he spared neither time nor pains with his pupil, who was about three years old when his learned education commenced, and at length he made such progress in language as to be able to articulate no less than thirty words. It appears, however, that he was somewhat of a truant, and did not very willingly exert his talents, being rather pressed into the service of literature, and it was necessary that the words should be first pronounced to him each time before he spoke. The French academicians who mention this anecdote add that unless they had received the testimony of so great a man as Leibniz, they should scarcely have dared to relate the circumstance. An invalid gentleman who resided for some years on Ham Common in Surrey had a dog which distinctly pronounced John, William, and two or three other words. A medical friend of mine who attended this gentleman has frequently heard the animal utter these words, and a female relative of his, who was often on a visit at his house, assures me of the fact. Indeed, it need not be doubted. These are the only two instances I have met with of talking dogs. But my brother had a beautiful little spaniel named Dahl, who was an indefatigable hunter, after woodcocks and snipes. Dahl would come home in the evening after a hard day's sport, wet, tired and dirty, and then deposit herself on the rug before the fire. Happening one day to pull her ear gently when in this state, she expressed her dislike to be disturbed by a sort of singing noise. By repeating this from day to day, and saying, Sing, doll, she would utter notes of a somewhat musical tone, and continue for some time after I had ceased to touch her ear, to the amusement and surprise of those who heard her. Poor doll! I shall never see your like again, either for beauty or intelligence. If she was affronted, she would come to me at a distance of four miles, remain some time, and then return to her master. A small cur, blind of one eye, lame, ugly, old, and somewhat selfish, yet possessed of great shrewdness, was usually fed with three large dogs. Watching his opportunity, he generally contrived to seize the best bit of offal or bone, with which he retreated into a recess, the opening to which was so small that he knew the other dogs could not follow him into it, and where he enjoyed his repast without the fear of molestation. Early habits predominate strongly in dogs, and indeed in other animals. At the house of a gentleman in Wexford, out of four dogs to guard the premises, three of them would always wag their tails, and express what might be called civility on the approach of any well-dressed visitors, manifesting, on the other hand, no very friendly feelings towards vagrants or ill-dressed people. The fourth, a sort of foxhound, which, as a puppy had belonged to a poor man, always seemed to recognize beggars and ill-dressed passengers as old familiar friends, growling at well-attired strangers, barking vehemently at gigs, and becoming almost frantic with rage at a four-wheeled carriage. The olfactory nerves of a dog are quite extraordinary, and it is said that, making allowance for difference of corporeal bulk, they are about four times larger than those of a man. Some dogs, however, seem to excel in acuteness of hearing 
and others in peculiar powers of vision. We quote the following from the Percy Anecdotes. One day when Dumont, a tradesman of the Rue Saint-Denis, was walking into the boulevard Saint-Antoine with a friend, he offered to lay a wager with the latter that if he were to hide a six-livre piece in the dust, his dog would discover and bring it to him. The wager was accepted, and the piece of money secreted after being carefully marked. When the two had proceeded some distance from the spot, M. Dumont called to his dog that he had lost something, and ordered him to seek it. Caniche immediately turned back, and his master and his companion pursued their walk to the Rue Saint-Denis. Meanwhile, a traveller, who happened to be just then returning in a small chaise from Vincennes, perceived the piece of money, which his horse had kicked from its hiding-place. He alighted, took it up, and drove to his inn in the Rue pont aux -Chaux. Caniche had just reached the spot in search of the lost piece when the stranger picked it up. He followed the chaise, went into the inn, and stuck close to the traveller. Having scented out the coin, which he had been ordered to bring back in the pocket of the ladder, he leapt up incessantly at and about him. The traveller, supposing him to be some dog that had been lost or left behind by his master, regarded his different movements as marks of fondness, and as the animal was handsome, he determined to keep him. He gave him a good supper, and on retiring to bed, took him with him to his chamber. No sooner had he pulled off his breeches than they were seized by the dog. The owner, conceiving that he wanted to play with them, took them away again. The animal began to bark at the door, which the traveller opened, under the idea that the dog wanted to go out. Caniche snatched up the breeches, and away he flew. The traveller posted after him with his nightcap on, and literally sans culottes. Anxiety for the fate of a purse full of gold napoleons, of forty francs each, which was in one of the pockets, gave redoubled velocity to his steps. Caniche ran full speed to his master's house, where the stranger arrived in a moment afterwards, breathless and enraged. He accused the dog of robbing him. Sir, said the master, my dog is a very faithful creature, and if he has run away with your breeches, it is because you have in them money which does not belong to you. The traveller became still more exasperated. Compose yourself, sir, rejoined the other, smiling. Without doubt there is in your purse a six-livre piece, with such and such marks, which you have picked up in the boulevard Saint-Antoine, and which I threw down there with the firm conviction that my dog would bring it back again. This is the cause of the robbery which he has committed upon you. The stranger's rage now yielded to astonishment. He delivered the six-livre piece to the owner, and could not forbear caressing the dog, which had given him so much uneasiness and such an unpleasant chase. A gentleman in Cornwall possessed a dog which seemed to set a value on white and shining pebble stones, of which he had made a large collection in a hole under an old tree. A dog in Regent Street is said to have barked with joy upon hearing the wheels of his master's carriage driven to the door when he could not by any possibility see the vehicle, and while many other carriages were at the same time passing and repassing. This, I believe, is a fact by no means uncommon. My retriever will carry an egg in his mouth to a great distance and during a considerable length of time without ever breaking or even cracking the shell. A small bird, having escaped from its cage and fallen into the sea, a dog conveyed it in his mouth to the ship without doing it the slightest injury. One of the carriers of a New York paper called The Advocate, having become indisposed, his son took his place, but not knowing the subscribers he was to supply, he took for his guide a dog which had usually attended his father. The animal trotted on ahead of the boy and stopped at every door where the paper was in use to be left, without making a single omission or mistake. The following is from a newspaper of this year. A most extraordinary circumstance has just occurred at the Haywick Toll Bar, which is kept by two old women. It appears that they had a sum of money in the house and were extremely alarmed lest they should be robbed of it. Their fears prevailed to such an extent that, when a carrier whom they knew was passing by, they urgently requested him to remain with them all night, which, however, his duties would not permit him to do. But, in consideration of the alarm of the women, he consented to leave with them a large mastiff dog. In the night, 
the women were disturbed by the uneasiness of the dog, and heard a noise apparently like an attempt to force an entrance into the premises, upon which they escaped by the back door and ran to a neighboring house, which happened to be a blacksmith's shop. They knocked at the door, and were answered from within by the smith's wife. She said her husband was absent, but that she was willing to accompany the terrified women to their home. On reaching the house, they heard savage but half-stifled growling from the dog. On entering, they saw the body of a man hanging half in and half out of their little window, whom the dog had seized by the throat and was still worrying. On examination, the man proved to be their neighbor, the blacksmith, dreadfully torn about the throat and quite dead. A dog belonging to the late Dr. Robert Hooper, had been in the constant habit of performing various little personal services for his master, such as fetching his slippers, etc. It happened one day that Dr. Hooper had been detained by his professional duties much beyond his usual dinner hour. The dog impatiently waited for his arrival, and he at last returned, weary and hungry. After showing his pleasure at the arrival of his master, greeting him with his usual attention, the animal remained tolerably quiet until he conceived a reasonable time had elapsed for the preparation of the doctor's dinner. As it did not, however, make its appearance, the dog went into the kitchen, seized with his mouth a half-broiled beefsteak, with which he hastened back to his master, placing it on the tablecloth before him. A few years ago, the public were amused with an account given in the newspapers of a dog which possessed the strange fancy of attending all of the fires that occurred in the metropolis. The discovery of this predilection was made by a gentleman residing a few miles from town, who was called up in the middle of the night by the intelligence that the premises adjoining his house of business were on fire. The removal of all my books and papers, said he, in telling the story, of course claimed my attention. Yet, notwithstanding this, and the bustle which prevailed, my eye every now and then rested on a dog, which, during the hottest progress of the conflagration, I could not help noticing running about and apparently taking a deep interest in what was going on. Contriving to keep himself out of everybody's way, and yet always present amidst the thickest of the stir. When the fire was got under, and I had leisure to look about me, I again observed the dog, which, with the fireman, appeared to be resting from the fatigues of duty, and was led to make some inquiries respecting him. "'Is this your dog, my friend?' said I to a fireman. "'No, sir,' said he. "'It does not belong to me, or to anyone in particular. We call him the fireman's dog.' "'The fireman's dog,' I replied. "'Why so? Has he no master?' "'No, sir,' rejoined the fireman. "'He calls none of us master.' though we are all of us willing enough to give him a night's lodging and a pennyworth of meat. But he won't stay long with any of us. His delight is to be at all the fires in London, and, far or near, we generally find him on the road as we are going along, and sometimes, if it is out of town, we give him a lift. I don't think there has been a fire for these two or three years past which he has not been at. The communication was so extraordinary that I found it difficult to believe the story until it was confirmed by the concurrent testimony of several other firemen. None of them, however, were able to give any account of the early habits of the dog, or to offer any explanation of the circumstances which led to this singular propensity. Some time afterwards I was again called up in the night to a fire in the village in which I resided, Camberwell, in Surrey, and to my surprise here I again met with the fireman's dog, still alive and well, pursuing with the same apparent interest and satisfaction the exhibition of that which seldom fails to bring with it disaster and misfortune, oftentimes loss of life and ruin. Still he called no man master, disdained to receive bed or board from the same hand more than a night or two at a time, nor could the fireman trace out his resting place. Such was the account of this interesting animal, as it appeared in the newspapers, to which were shortly afterwards appended several circumstances, communicated by a fireman at one of the police offices. A magistrate, having asked him whether it was a fact that the dog was present at most of the fires that occurred in the metropolis, the fireman replied that he never knew Tyke, as he was called, to be absent from a fire upon any occasion that he, the fireman, attended himself. 
the magistrate said the dog must have an extraordinary predilection for fires he then asked what length of time he had been known to possess that propensity the fireman replied that he knew tyke for the last nine years and although he was getting old yet the moment the engines were about tyke was to be seen as active as ever running off in the direction of the fire the magistrate inquired whether the dog lived with any particular fireman the fireman replied that tyke liked one fireman as well as another he had no particular favorites but passed his time amongst them sometimes going to the house of one and then to another and off to a third when he was tired day or night it was all the same to him if a fire broke out there he was in the midst of the bustle running from one engine to another anxiously looking after the firemen and although pressed upon by crowds yet from his dexterity he always escaped accidents only now and then getting a ducking from the engines which he rather liked than otherwise the magistrate said that tyke was a most extraordinary animal and having expressed a wish to see him he was shortly after exhibited at the office and some other peculiarities respecting him were related there was nothing at all particular in the appearance of the dog he was a rough-looking small animal of the terrier breed and seemed to be in excellent condition no doubt from the care taken of him by the firemen belonging to the different companies there was some difficulty experienced in bringing him to the office as he did not much relish going any distance from where the firemen are usually to be found except in cases of attending with them at a conflagration and then distance was of no consequence it was found necessary to use stratagem for the purpose a fireman commenced running tyke accustomed to follow upon such occasions set out after him but this person having slackened his pace on the way the sagacious animal knowing there was no fire turned back and it was necessary to carry him to the office end of introduction part three